Together and we'll get started soon. So we're continuing our series on apologetics and this week we're going to look at um, some things that are a little bit more practical we're going to talk about how to actually engage with believers how to ask them questions understand their view understand why they believe what they believe and also just look out for you know opinions and things that don't have a basis that they don't have evidence for um, and ultimately try to show them that the christian worldview is the one that makes the most sense and works um, in the world uh, but first uh, of course, we know that you know, a major problem when we're doing apologetics, a major reason it's hard to uh, engage with people and persuade people is because they have assumptions, they have worldviews that they use to interpret the world, to uh, interpret the facts and the evidence as they see it. Um, and we're going to look in a, in a, at an example of this, of worldviews and how powerful they can be. And the example we're going to use is, is pretty controversial, but the point isn't to engage in the controversy. But here, here's our example. If we can slides to turn so look at these these headlines on gun control now first the point is not to d discuss gun control we're not going to start a debate on that obviously but the, the point is just to gauge your reaction to this so being in idaho and you know i have a pretty good sense how most people will probably respond to these how i would respond to them um and you know if you maybe you're on if you're on the other side of the issue you could imagine if you see headlines that you disagree with how you might respond to it so what what do, what do you think about that do you think when you read those headlines, you think, wow, I better go read those studies. I better go figure this out. Maybe I, maybe I had my view wrong. Is that, is that what you're going to do? Yeah, probably not, right? No, because you, you have a world view um, about those things. You already kind of come to conclusions about it. So when you he see headlines on that, you have assumptions that you just assume things that those, those studies are maybe wrong, that they have their facts wrong or their bias. You actually have assumptions and world views about people who disagree with you that they're biased and that they're coming to um, conclusions not based on the facts. And that's, um, that's you know, somewhat appropriate, right? I mean, nobody has a neutral stance on things. Nobody comes to, to evidence and studies and facts um, just you know, looking for, for the evidence. They actually have ideas in their head that they bring to the table that they use to understand things. So those are, those are assumptions or worldviews, or the term we used last week was presuppositions, or things they presuppose about the world that they use to understand it. And controversial issues similar to this can kind of show us how, how tightly we hold them, how it's hard for us to even look at alternative facts because we were so convinced, right? And, you know, we very well may be true, may be true what we're convinced of. Um, so how do, you, how do you overcome a disagreement in this area, though? Do you think if you send them study, headlines of studies and things that they'll, they'll be persuaded? Pro probably not, right? Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're trying to get to more root issues of why they believe it. Um, it usually has something to do with their values, right? Their, their assumptions about things other than just the facts, right? And that, that's what we're trying to get at, is those, those underlying worldview values. Uh, that's what we're trying to get at when we're looking at Christian things as well. So last week, we talked about our, our method for going about this. There's different views on, you know, how you persuade people. Some people say it's all just about the facts. It's about evidence. It's about saying you're neutral and trying to argue people to God using reason. But our view understands that it's not enough. The only way we can actually make sense of the world is if we start with God, if God is our authority and he's actually explained the world to us. And so we have to, when we're engaging with people, remember their assumptions, remember their, their presuppositions about the world, and that they're going to interpret the evidence a certain way because of them. So you're kind of, um, you, you have to realize that, you know, you have to deal with root issues. You have to ask why they believe it, like uh, Beggs was saying. So the, in our view, the authority is the Bible. That's our ultimate authority. It's our starting point. Um, we dealt with um, circular reasoning, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about today as well. 
And then ultimately the goal is to show that our assumptions, our worldview, our presuppositions, they work best, right? They actually can explain things like morality, why there's logic, why people live a certain way. Um, it, actually, it actually works. People who come up with alternatives, other ways of viewing the world, other assumptions don't actually work. And then we didn't get to this last week, but we'll, we'll look quickly at how we actually use scripture, how we use our worldview. Um, some people say we should kind of set those things aside because we're trying to argue for the biblical worldview, but we, we actually want to take a stance where we're presenting it to people clearly and using it to persuade them. So we'll look at that a little bit today. But really what we're going to try to get into um, is... Oops, sorry. Let me, really what we're going to try to get into is four steps for... Um, well, so I, well, we'll go through that. I was going to skip this slide. But again, there's, there's evidence, there's arguments to believe or not believe in the Christian worldview, um, right? There tend to be good arguments, but people, they're not neutral, they're not objective about it. Um, instead, they have presuppositions, they have prior commitments that they use to evaluate this. Um, and so those presuppositions are this network of worldview ideas about the world that they use to, to understand it. So we can, in our view, we can use evidences, we should use evidences, but in the end, we have to get down to their biases and their assumptions about the world. That's what will really actually have an effect. And we're going to do that through four steps. So these are four, four kind of steps or things you should do when you're engaging with people to actually get down to those presuppositions, get down to the root issues of how they view the world. So the first thing is just to ask lots of questions. That's something you should be doing throughout. Questions tend to be more helpful than just stating your views or making statements. And really the goal is to understand the unbeliever. You have to actually understand what they believe and why they believe it. You can't come in with assumptions on thinking you know why they believe what they believe. You have to actually try to engage with them and deal with them personally. Um, another thing that we have to do throughout is point out biased and arbitrary opinions. People are full of opinions and ideas but they rarely actually have reasons for them. They really, rarely have actually thought through them. So you have to point that out, like, hey, so you, you made this statement, but why do you believe that? Do you actually have a reason for believing that, or is it just an assumption? And then as you start engaging with them and learning more about them and asking questions, they're going to be inconsistent. It's just inevitable, because only, you can only be consistent and live consistently if you have a view of the world that the Bible presents. So in the end, they're always going to have some sort of inconsistency, there's going to be something that doesn't make sense, and so you have to sort of guide, gently guide them and point that out for them. And then finally, the end goal is to demonstrate that our, our, our view does work, it actually isn't inconsistent, it makes sense of the world, um, and it makes sense of how they live in their, because um, everybody, like, an example of that is morality, right? Everybody believes in some sort of morals, they, they'll eventually admit that they're objective, but they don't have any way of explaining that. But we do, right? We believe God's given us a conscience. So our, the end goal is to show them that the biblical worldview is best. So um, first, let's look a little bit about how we use Scripture in our view, um, how, we, how we present Scripture. So when we're making statements and when we're talking about things, we do want to be sure to ground the authority for what we believe in the Bible, right? If, that, if we think that actually is the ultimate standard and the ultimate criteria for what's true and false, then we should live consistently with our worldview and actually use it and present it as being authoritative, right? We don't, we don't um, want to start with the assumption, well, I'm just going to start with reason and then show you how the most reasonable and rational thing is to believe in a God. Um, that's not what we do. We start with the Bible and its authority, um, and we tell people, you know, this isn't, this isn't something we made up. This isn't a myth. So here's a, uh, 2 Peter 1, 16 and verse 20 and 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So they, these were real events that actually happened in time. They weren't just made up myths or ideas to try to explain the world like so many of the other, uh, you know, Greeks and everybody else would do, but they're real things that actually happen. Verse 20, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation or imagination, right? They didn't just imagine these things. It's not their view of the world. It's God's view of the world they're presenting. Four, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God. So it was men speaking. These are, these are words of men, but they're from God. They're carried along by the Holy Spirit. So they're um, inspired and inerrant. So that's our authority, and we should be consistent with actually using it and presenting it as an authority. Um, 
but what we're not going to do is say, hey, yeah, you know, I realize you think that your reason can get you there, but I don't think that'll actually work. You actually need someone from the outside speaking in to the world to make sense of it. Um, and then often you'll have to, when you do that, respond to the charge of circular reasoning. So we talked about that a little bit last week. What are, what are some responses you can do for, for someone who says, well, that's begging the question, that's circular reasoning? Remember, we tried to make a distinction between begging the question and circular reasoning. So what are some ways you could respond to that? What do you think? <coughs> right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's exactly right. So everybody has some starting point, right? Everybody, everybody has some way that they, um, that they decide what's true and right. Um, so an example of this, um, or an analogy you could use is a meter stick analogy. So let's say you have a meter stick and you, you you think that's, you know, that's what a meter is. Well, how do you know if that meter stick is accurate? Well, you can take it to maybe somebody who has sort of like a standard or like a, a check to use to see if the meter stick's accurate. So you bring it there and you, you use it and you're like, yeah, this, this matches my, uh, my meter as well. So it's a meter. But then you could ask, well, how do you know that meter's right? And then you kind of keep going back and forth and be like, something has to be the standard, right? Something has to be your starting point for what a meter is. And there actually, there actually was, I think in England somewhere, where there's sort of the, the, an iron bar that was the ultimate standard of what a meter was. And every other meter had to be compared to that. And that, that ultimate standard, like how do, you, how do you go about proving that? Well, you, you can't really, right? I mean, it, it just, it's the ultimate standard, so it is what it is. And everybody, everybody has something like this. So everybody has some ultimate standard that they use, some presupposition um, that they use to decide what's true and false. And you can always bring this out with two simple questions, really. So the first question is, okay, so what is your ultimate standard? How do you decide what's true and false? And they'll maybe throw something out like science or observations, you know, their experience, or maybe it's reason and logic is my standard. I, everything I do I has to match with logic. And then the second question you can ask after that is, well, how do you know that logic is the ultimate standard to use? And what do you, how do you think they'll respond? What do you think they'll use to prove logic is the ultimate standard? Yeah, right. They're going to use logic to prove logic. So in that sense, it's, it's still circular. If they say, well, I think it's science. Everything has to match with science. It's like, okay, well, how do you know that? Well, every, every, I believe, you know, it's, I use science for that. Or if they don't use science, maybe they, they use some other argument and it's like, well, if you're not using science, then is that really your ultimate standard, right? So it, it always works this way. There's always some sort of circular reasoning when you talk about um, ultimate standards for what's true and false. And of course, we can do things like give more evidence and you know, not actually give reasons why our standard is better. So it's not begging the question. It's not avoiding answering the question. So we should use scripture. We should ground it in um, our, our statements in the authority of the Bible, they should know that it's not just coming from us. So the, the kind of the, 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 one of the struggles you have is, you know, how do you actually have a conversation with someone if, if you have different assumptions, right? If you have your assumptions and you're interpreting the evidence one way, they have their assumptions that they're doing something different with it, like how do you bridge that gap? How do you actually um, um, engage in a conversation with them. And it, it can be kind of difficult. What you kind of have to do is you have to sort of explain your whole view and then show that how it works better and kind of invite them to be like, okay, think about this from a Christian perspective. It actually does make sense, right? So like for miracles, for example. Okay, I understand that you don't agree with miracles, but like from a Christian perspective, if there's a God, then it kind of makes sense that he can do miracles and you know, suspend laws of physics. And similarly, you, you, know, you can kind of enter their world and try to show that your world doesn't actually work with these things. So because of this, it's important that we, we, we try to present the biblical worldview as a whole um, and not use a block-by-block block methodology. So what some people teach is that they say you should, um, you just start with God, right? You first try to prove that there's some God out there, there has to be some infinite being out there. You don't, it's not the, necessarily the God of the Bible. It's not, you know, the Christian God, but just there has to be something out there that caused all this. And then from there, you start trying to build up, well, if there's a God, maybe, don't you think he probably would have spoken to us? Um, and so you kind of block by block try to build up your view. And that's, I don't think that's very effective. 
because you can only make sense of the world with that Christian God. And so you have to present the entire thing to people um, rather than just bits and pieces. Obviously, there's, you know, it, it happens over time, but you shouldn't be scared to try to, you know, present things about the biblical worldview before you've convinced them that a God exists. Um, and really, a, a good way to do that is through evidences. So um, we can use them to, to interweave the gospel into our apologetics, right? In the end, our goal is to give them the gospel. Our goal is to um, present, um, you know, the way of salvation and, and the worldview that you can make sense of that in. So we should be trying to do that throughout our apologetics um, and not just, you know, you know, well, I couldn't convince them there wasn't a God, so I'm not going to give them the gospel yet, right? That's not what we want to do. We want to actually try to interweave this stuff within. And here's a, a few ways you can do it. So creationism, for example, if you're giving evidence for creation or you're, you're talking about how someone had to create the world, that's a pretty easy um, in to explain that God is the creator. He made you. He owns you. You should submit to him. But, you know, creatures have rebelled. So you can, you can talk about the biblical worldview when you're talking about creationism. What about if someone brings up the problem of evil? What kind of things can you talk about in the Christian worldview when you're discussing the problem of evil? What do you think? <clears throat> what, what does evil assume? Right, yeah, so there's got to be some right and wrong. There's someone who's given us rules, right? So you can talk about that there, there is evil in the world, there is right and wrong. Maybe you could talk about the fall, right? God created man, but he fell into sin, and now that's why the world um, is corrupted and is the way it is. You could talk about God's sovereignty, how everything's done for his glory. Similar to the moral argument, right? If you talk about morals, um, what, like, why does everyone have some sense that there's, there's objective morality? There's, mora there's some that's wrong, right and wrong for everybody at, of all time. Why do people assume that? or believe that ultimately. Right. 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 So we have a, everybody has a conscience, everybody knows the difference between right and wrong and they've they've violated their conscience, they've they've disobeyed. Um, which makes them accountable to a creator. So you can talk about, you know, sin there. If you're giving evidence for Jesus' life and resurrection, that's, I mean, that's an easy one to give the gospel, right? Talk about the cross and why he had to come to earth and die. Um, if you're giving evidence for scripture from prophecy, you could, you know, showing how scripture has fulfilled prophecy, you can, and say God, the Bible's also made prophecy about the future and that he is coming again and there's going to be a restoration, um, you could give evidence for scripture's reliability, so you can talk about God has spoken and we should listen to him. And, you know, that's, all those things are, are the gospel. And then through your apologetics, you can actually present the gospel to people. One thing to keep in mind when you're doing this, though, is that you shouldn't feel responsible to make everything sound extra reasonable and respectable to people, right? So people will often say, well, I mean, I, don't, I think if God exists that he would be like this, or I don't think God would believe in hell, right? So you're probably, you're not going to be successful making sense of hell to them most likely, right? They're going to they're gonna reject that. They're going to think it doesn't make sense. And you can just explain to them, yeah, you know, the, the Bible says you would do that. The Bible says that this, this worldview is foolish to um, unbelievers. So you're not going to be able to make sense of every specific thing. But in the end, people, like, they can't reject God because they don't like him, right? If he's there, then, then he's there, and, and you have to submit to him. So just because they can't make sense of everything or they don't like everything they hear, that isn't, that isn't a good reason to reject, to reject God. Um, so th that's how we should use scripture. The next thing we're going to look at, um, trying to get into a little bit more practical how you actually engage with people, is asking questions. So um, let's look at just some examples here. Um, so if someone makes a statement, you have to be reasonable. How do you think you could respond to that? Um, you might agree, or you might ask, you know, what do you mean by that? Like, what does it mean to be reasonable? Is it, is it logic? Is it science? You're trying to understand what they're actually saying. If someone says, I don't believe in God, you might ask, why not, right? If someone says, there's no proof of God's existence. 
you could ask, well, what, what kind of proof do you want, right? What are, what are your standards for proving things? Um, someone says morality is relative. How do you think you'd respond to that? Morality is relative. What was that? Relative to what? Re okay, yeah, what, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Consciences will tell them different things. Right. And so, if we're to have any kind of common ground, there has to be an absolute standard. Mm -hmm. But if it's all just matter in the universe, then one atom bumping into another atom, or one person right. bumping into another person, can't be morally right or wrong. Right. Right. So you're kind of trying to bring out that like they don't actually have a basis for, for saying that statement, right? You might bring up examples, kind of like what you did, like, well, what about genocide? Is that, is that always wrong or just wrong sometimes? Um, so I think asking questions is a good way to actually engage with people and get them talking more. Some people call this um, the, the, the Columbo technique. So if you've ever seen um, Columbo, what, what's the one thing he always says, says, right? Just one more thing, right? Just one more question or... He's very sort of unassuming and gets people talking because he asks questions and it sort of draws things out. And then he starts to see inconsistencies in people's stories and realizing what they're saying doesn't match up with, with the, the crime scene. So that's kind of what we're doing with asking questions is we're trying to draw people out. We're trying to show inconsistencies. We're trying to make sense of what they're saying. And there's a few different kind of, well, there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that. Can you think of other good reasons to ask questions? What else does it do? Um, when you ask questions. Breaks the ice. Breaks the ice. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Because if you just start, if you go to someone and just say, um, well, you know, I believe in God and here's why, you know, it, it's probably not going to be very engaging for them. But if you ask questions, it kind of starts the conversation off. Um, right. Right, exactly. You kind of you are able to lead the conversation and make them put the burden of proof on them to um, prove what they actually believe. Um, yeah, so it, it helps us understand the person, what they think, and why they think it. Um, it sort of starts off the conversation without being offensive. It's a, little bit, it's a bit more disarming, usually. Um, and it draws out unbelievers' reasons, or usually, more often, their lack of reasons for their statements. Um, it takes pressure off of you. You don't need to have all the answers right away. If they make some statement and maybe you don't know exactly what to say, you don't know um, how to respond to it, you don't really need to respond to it right away. Just ask another question and just keep asking questions until you kind of see something you, you really want to go after. Um, it allows you to be in the driver's seat of the conversation. So, so often, if you're just making statements back and forth, they'll make a statement, you make a statement, and then they just move on to the next thing, and they just are dodging all around, and it's hard to get anywhere with them. But if you're asking questions, you're actually guiding them and leading them in the direction you want them to go. And so you can pick something and really, really focus on it. So it allows you to be more in more control of the conversation with, with an unbeliever. Um, and ultimately, it allows you to lead people to certain conclusions. And really, they're, they're coming to the conclusion themselves, typically, if you're, if you're doing a good job asking questions, rather than just making a statement that, that they're going to immediately reject. So here's, here's some examples of asking questions and the types of questions. So one example is um, questions that gather information. So you're just trying to, to understand them, understand what they believe. So you might you know, very specifically say, so what do you believe about God? What do you believe about morality? Um, it could be, could you explain what you mean by that, right? So if you ever hear a term you don't know, just, you, you don't need to be worried about that. Just ask them what it means. And even if you, you kind of know what the term means, sometimes it's good to have them explain it um, to see if they actually know what the term means or see what they mean by it specifically. Um, and then also I think it's helpful to try to summarize what they're saying often. So they might be saying a lot of things, you know, they're all over the place. And like, so it seems like what you're saying is this. Is that right? Um, to make sure you're, you're actually understanding them. Because if you don't understand them, then you're never going to be able to actually help them, right? Help them with their real issues um, and the real, the real questions that they have. And then another type of question that you should be asking often is questions that ask for reasons. So they make a claim and you'd be like, well, how, so how do you know that that's actually true? Do you have any evidence for that? What, you know, what's your reasons for that? So like someone, someone says, there was a big bang. Say, so, okay, what evidence do you have 
for that? Do you, do you have any evidence? And they're probably not going to have any. Um, another type of question to ask is, is questions that point out inconsistencies. So, and, and when you're doing this, you, you, you want to be genuine about it. So it's not, um, you're not trying to, it's not an interrogation per, sway, per, per se. You're not trying to be offensive in this. Um, so you, you should have some, some, be gentle about it. But you are trying to make sense of what they say, right? So maybe they said something earlier, and you're like, well, you, you, said, you said morality is relative, but right now you seem really upset at people who are intolerant. Um, how does that work together? Um, or if they say something is, is true, like, how, so you're saying, you know, you can't know anything, um, but you seem pretty sure about that. How does, how does that work? Um, right, so example, all truth is relative. Um, is that true, right? You're kind of pointing out that what you're saying doesn't exactly make sense. Um, another example, this, this one's kind of interesting. If someone says, you know, I don't think you can know if God exists or not, or I'm, a, I'm an ag agnostic. What, what, what is an agnostic? Um, does anybody know the difference between an agnostic and an atheist, or what people say is a difference? Right, exactly. Yep. So atheists, they're a bit more sure about it. They're saying, I know there isn't a God, and I'm going to live like it, right? An agnostic says, well, maybe there's a God, I just don't know. But you can ask an agnostic if they say something like that. Well, so if you're not sure, maybe there's a God, maybe there's not, does that mean you go to, um, this is from John Frame, does that mean you go to church every other week, right? You're hedging your bets. Um, and they probably not, right? So everybody, even if they claim to be an agnostic, they're, they're usually living like an atheist, which shows what they, what they really believe. They don't believe in a God, or at least they tell themselves that. Um, so we want questions that point out inconsistencies, and then, then ultimately we want questions that lead. We want to, to drive them to certain conclusions about the world. So usually, usually I'm going to show an example conversation that you might have with someone, just how this works. Usually it's not, it's not super neat, right? People will throw out red herrings, they'll try to redirect, they'll be all over the place, um, and you'll have to have a lot more clarifying questions and stuff, so it can take time. Um, but I think it's helpful to see sort of a general way that you can guide people to certain conclusions. So here's, uh, here's an example of, of a sort of a question and answer back and forth from someone, um, a believer and an unbeliever. So let's say an unbeliever makes a statement, um, the Bible is a myth. Right? So what, what might you respond to that? Like, what's an example question? Yeah, how do you know that? Like, why, why do you think that? Do you have a reason for that? So like, yeah, why do you think that? How do you know? And they might come back, well, because it has miracles in it. So if it has miracles in it, then, then it's a myth. Um, and you could come back and say, well, okay, so why don't you think miracles can happen, right? Um, do you actually have a reason for not believing in miracles? And I, why do you think people don't believe in miracles? What might they get back with? What was that? It defies, science. it defies science. Yeah, exactly. That's typically what they'll say. They'll say something like, well, I believe in science, right? And um, what would you say to that? I believe in, like, do you say, well, I don't believe in science, right? <laughs> you shouldn't. Um, Is there evidence? Okay, yeah, so figure, figuring out, like, I think that's along the right line. So how do, how do you actually prove miracles can't happen from science, right? Can you, can you actually do that? And the per like, how, how do you do that? You can't, right? That's, science is about um, observations and, and repeating tests, so that doesn't really work with miracles. Um, so the, the, um, <clears throat> the person might respond, well, Science believes that everything has a natural explanation. So notice, what, what are they doing here? Are they answering the question? Not really, right? They're, they're, kind of, they're kind of dodging it. So they're dodging the question and then just stating something that science believes everything has a natural explanation. Is that true? Does science believe that? True science that Right. Yeah, so it's, it's not like, what is science exactly? It's, I mean, people use that term for uh, kind of broad meanings, but 
in the end, like it's, it's about the scientific method, right? So you might point out, well, the scientific method, it does draw conclusions from observations, right? You can observe things in the world and, and make conclusions about it. So what, what observations have you actually made about miracles? Have you observed miracles, you know, not happening or happening? And they're going to be like, well, they, they can't, right? That's kind of the point of a miracle is it's not, it's not something that you can test with science, and they can't go back throughout all of history through all the claims and actually test to see if a miracle happened, right? Um, and the unbeliever might, might uh, recognize that. You might have to get them there. Um, so then, then you might ask, okay, so you can't, actually, you can't actually prove that, right? You can't actually prove miracles don't happen from science. So it's just an assumption you have, right? You just assume everything has a natural explanation. Um, and no one has actually proven that one way or the other with science. How do you think the unbeliever will respond to that? Any ideas? The, what was that? Um, so they might, they might admit that they can't prove it, but then they're going to be like, but you can't prove it either, right? And it's like, okay, yeah, sure, I'm not, I can't prove it with science. But does it kind of make, then you, this is where you can kind of start to show that um, where the assumptions come in, right? Yes, I, maybe we can't prove it with science, but I, I believe in God, and if there's a God, I think miracles make sense in that worldview, right? And, but you'll never actually accept that, right? You'll never accept miracles because you're assuming that everything has a natural explanation. You're, you're sort of assuming miracles can't happen from the outset, um, even though you can't necessarily prove it, right? So you're, you're trying to show them the, the, the presuppositions that they each have, the assumptions that they're each making. Um, and then, you know, hopefully you can get to the point where they'll at least admit that, that it's an assumption. Um, you might have to, again, work, work to get there a bit. So since you can't prove the miracles don't happen, it's just an assumption you have when the re you read the Bible, right? So they're taking that assumption about the world, about materialism, um, and saying miracles can happen. So when I read the Bible and I read a miracle, they're, they're always going to come to that conclusion, right? No matter what. And so it's just, it's just really begging the question in the end, and that's, that's what you're trying to get to. So if you reject the Bible as a myth because it has miracles in it, you're rejecting it because of unproven assumptions, right? They haven't actually proved miracles can't happen. They're just assuming it, and now they're rejecting the Bible for it. So they're, they're actually not getting anywhere, right? They're begging the question. So that's sort of an example of how you can try to lead someone to, to a conclusion and make them realize their presuppositions are bringing them to... Um, what they believe. They don't, actually, they don't actually have good reasons for it. So asking questions is really important. And again, we'll lo look at one of the reasons for that is to understand a believer's worldview. So this, this we have as, as step one. Um, sort of the first thing that you should be trying to do is you should actually need, you need to know something about what the person believes. Um, here's a quote from Francis Schaeffer, which is, which is uh, interesting. If, if I, this is what he said about engaging with, with believers um, with a different worldview. Um, if I have only an hour with someone, I will spend the first 55 minutes asking questions and finding out what is troubling their heart and mind. And then in the last five minutes, I will, I will share something of the truth, right? So he's just showing the, the emphasis you should put on in actually understanding the person, which I think is appropriate. Because um, if you're just making statements and just stating what you're, you believe, you're not actually going to get anywhere, right? You're only going to get somewhere if you understand what they think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you're not just saying what you want to say and then acting like they're just kind of like a block just sitting there receiving what you're saying. Right. Like, if your goal is to, in apologetics, is to get to the gospel, why do you want to get to the gospel? It's because you love them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, asking questions, even, like, if it's a coworker or something, like, even, like, before you start getting to say mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That's that's a great point. Yeah. So you, you want to be genuine, right? You want to actually get to know the person, you know, care about what they think, understand why they believe it, and, and emphasize, um, have some empathy with them. And so yeah, that's a great point. So questions questions are just a great way to sort of, um, you know, have a start a relationship, have a relationship. So it's not just about you um, hitting them over the head with the Bible. So that's that's a great point. Um, so there's there's no, um, there's no formula. So we have sort of these, these four steps that 
or trying to help you, you know, different ways you can engage, and you can kind of do that with anyone. But part of the point of asking questions is you don't really know how they're going to respond, right? They're going to have diff different people are going to have different ideas and different reasons, and so you have to understand them as a person, and you should do that genuinely as well. Um, another thing to keep in mind is um, oftentimes when you, if you're studying different worldviews or different ideas about the world, um, if you're studying like philosophers, they're, they're going to actually have thought through their position and they're going to try to be consistent with it. You know, in the end, they won't be able to. But when you deal with real people, they're usually all over the place, right? They, they have different ideas from Eastern religions. They have ideas from Christianity. They have ideas from naturalism and evolution, right? They're just all over the place, and, and none of it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, so you, you have to be ready for that and really ask questions to try to make sense of it. So in one sense, it, it makes it difficult because people haven't thought through things, but in another sense, it, it, it's kind of helpful because there's a lot of inconsistencies that you can point out and try to, try to help them and guide them through. Um, and also, just as you're, as you're trying to understand, it's remember, you don't need to know everything. You're not going to know everything, and that's okay. Um, so if you don't know something, just be honest about it. Um, it can actually sometimes be a, um, a, a helpful way to to have an excuse for a follow-up. It's like, I don't really know that. I don't understand that, but I'll look into it and get back to you. Um, so there's going to be a lot of things you don't know, and that's fine. You try to focus on the things you do know, um, but then, and then just, uh, you know, use it as a learning opportunity. And there's a lot of resources out there. So just, you can research, ask questions. There's tons of books. Um, you know, I think I mentioned John Frame's apologetics book. There's, there's a lot of other good resources. Jason Lyle, if you're looking, um, Ultimate Proof of Creation is a great book. Um, some websites I mentioned there, CARM, if you've heard of them, they just have, they're like an encyclopedia for apologetics. So pretty much most questions you'll have, you'll have something there that will help you. Answers in Genesis is a great resource for anything to do with creationism and about evolution. Uh, CMFnow.com, that's, that's one, uh, has apologetic resources from Greg Bonson. Can't vouch for their other topics, but... Um, if, you're, if you want to know more about kind of the stuff we talked about last week with presuppositionalism and the different ways to go about apologetics, it, they have a lot of uh, lectures and, and articles there. Um, you know, a logic course can be helpful. Um, just understanding how to think and how to reason is going to be important when you're engaging with people. And then just, you know, if you have friends or people you know. Um, and then, then always, you know, Google has every answer, of course. You just need to you need to have a bit more discernment if you, if you just start Googling things, but it can be helpful. Um, so we want to understand the believer's, the believer's worldview. And as we're, as we're understanding them, as we're asking questions, um, you want to start looking out for, for just opinions without evidence, opinions without reasons, opinions that show that they're biased, that they don't actually know why they believe what they believe other than they just, they just believe what they believe, right? They're arbitrary. They don't have um, something backing up what they're saying. So we, we want to watch out for those. Um, anything they say that they haven't actually proven, that they actually haven't actually given a reason for. And what you do with those when you hear them is you just ask them, okay, you know, could you explain that? How do you know that? You know, what's, what's your evidence for that again? Um, just start asking questions. So, you know, if someone says a worldwide flood doesn't seem plausible, it's like, well, why not? It's like, well, it just doesn't make sense to me. It's like, Okay, I mean, people will often, what they'll do is that they'll appeal to common sense. And they feel like if, well, it's just common sense. Like, you can't, how, do you, how are you going to disagree with common sense? Everybody should have common sense, right? But that's, that's not really a reason. Um, you, you know, reasons have to actually have some sort of um, proof, some sort of persuasion for people who disagree with you. Um, more just arbitrary statements. There's no historical record of Jesus' resurrection. Well, what do you think is the number one, when they, someone makes a claim like this, no historical record, what's the one historical record they're ignoring? The Bible, right? The most, the most reliable ancient work ever. Um, so they're, they're just, they don't actually, they haven't actually thought this through. You can't believe in science and God, which of course isn't, isn't true. Um, and they need, they need to be able to explain what they mean by that and why they think that. Um, that's fine for you, but I believe all religions have truth. How do you think you, what questions might you ask someone who makes that statement? I think all religions have some truth in it. By what standard? Yeah, like how do you know that? Like, so there's some standard of truth. You know, have you examined all these religions? Um, you know, how do you, yeah, how do you know that? Um, 
I'm sure the Bible has changed over hundreds of years. Notice, notice the language there, I'm sure. So people will say things like that, I'm sure, it seems likely, d- doesn't seem plausible, right? They're just like, this kind of makes sense to me. They're not, but it's not actually giving evidence for it. They're like, I just bet that happened. It's like, okay, like that's your guess, that's, right? That's not, that's not actually a valid, a valid reason. Um, so th- this is what we're looking out for when people are making these statements. And it's going to happen over and over and over again. It's probably the, one of the number one things you'll, you'll see and you'll hear is people just making statements, and then you have to ask them to prove it, ask them for reasons. And the, the reason I think it's so um, common is, is we live in a sound by generation, right? So what are examples of that? When I say that, you know, we live in a sound by generation, what comes to your mind? What was that? Com- okay, yeah. Right. Yep. Every, everything's just getting shorter, right? Um, the, you know, used to be, you know, you'd read newspapers or thick books to learn things, but now it's, uh, it's a, you know, 15 second Instagram story and people come to conclusions. Um, so we, we, everything's getting shorter, everything's getting simpler. Um, and also, I think because of relativism, people aren't expected or, or required to have reasons, right? So people can just say, here's my perspective, here's my opinion. It's like, oh, that's great, that's wonderful. Here's my perspective, here's my opinion, right? And you don't actually have to prove anything, and you don't need to because just, it just being your perspective is good enough. Um, you, you see that maybe even in, in like Bible studies, right? When someone says, you're going through, no, no Bible studies here to be clear, but if you go through like a Bible study where they're like, oh, you know, what does this verse mean to you? And they could just go around asking what, what this verse means to you, right? You're not actually trying to show what the author meant by it. You're just giving your opinion, and that's good enough. That's acceptable. Um, and also, I think, I think the internet has changed it, and media in general, right? Going from, from mainly written media to, to TV and now the internet, it has a big effect on how people process information, how people get their information. Um, if you, it's interesting, if you talk to people who've been in media for a long time um, and have seen the internet come along and how that changed things. So it used to be that newspapers had um, a process and a way to make sure everything they said, not maybe not everything, but they, they were actually cared about being accurate. They cared about being thoughtful and thinking through things and their, their articles would be long, they would be something you'd have to sit down and read through, but the internet has changed all that. So now with the internet, you know, um, you, you're trying to get things out as fast as possible. Before you at least had a day, right? You'd write the news for a day and then you'd, you'd publish it the next day. With the internet, you're trying to get it out as fast as possible so you don't actually have people fact-checking things. Um, you're, just, you're just publishing it. And then of course on the internet, what, what kind of things do people click on, right? It's clickbait, right? So people, there's there's whole formulas, there's whole ways that um, and like courses to teach people how to write headlines that make people click, um, and and that's what they do. They they write a headline that makes people click. They don't actually care if it's true or if it act act um, represents the point of the article because once they click, they start making money. So the internet has dramatically changed things to where. People don't care about accuracy as much anymore. People don't care about thoughtfulness. They're just, they're just putting out their opinion as fast as possible. And of course, people, they just, they just want clear-cut answers to complicated questions, right? They don't want to have to actually think through things. They just want it to be as simple and easy to understand as possible. So if, if this is the case, if people, right, they just really care about the conclusion, they don't actually care about the reasons why they believe what they believe, they just want the answer, right? Just give me the answer. What kind of answers do you think they'll go to and they'll believe? Right, exactly. So it's going to be the ones that make sense to them, the ones they like, the ones that fit with what they already believe. So if they find an answer that ex- goes with what they think, great, that's my answer, right? I don't actually need to prove it. Um, and that's, that's the way things are. They, they just choose the answers that they like best and make the most sense to them. Um, I think there's a good example of this even in, in the scriptures, um, talking about um, um, uh, pastors and teachers of the Bible. So, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, 
but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So notice, notice there's these, these teachers that they're accumulating, that they're, they're bringing them around, that they're listening to. And what, what are those teachers doing? Yeah, what, what does that mean? Yeah, telling people what they want to hear. But notice, who's, who's the one, why are those teachers there in the first place? How did the teachers get there in this place to tickle their ears? Right, it's the people, right? So in the end, it's the people who are finding these teachers that tell them what they want to hear. And then when they're telling them what they want to hear, they, you know, they'll, they'll listen, they'll stick around for that. Uh, or at least until they tell, at least until they offend them with something they don't want to hear, um, and th- I think this is true. This is true with with biblical doctrine. This is true in the church, and it's true in the world in pretty much every area. People people f- find people who tell them what they want to hear, and then they believe them, and then their 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 reason for what they believe. Um, it's interesting. Even even sometimes I remember listening to to some guy who was an author, a really popular author, and he was talking about his writing process. And he talked about how he'd have, I don't remember what it was, if it was like a, like a bobblehead or something that he'd have on his desk. And he said, that, that to me is the reader. So whenever I'm writing, I'm thinking about the reader, and I'm thinking about what he wants to hear, what, he, what will resonate with him, what he likes. And that's what I write down, is what he likes. So I had, and this was, it was about a topic that is pretty factual, but he's like, I'm just, I'm going to look, think about the reader and just say what he wants to hear, right? That's the way he goes about his writing process. And because of that, he's a very, very popular author. Um, <clears throat> but I think someone mentioned earlier uh, the idea of confirmation bias. So you, you favor things that confirm your existing beliefs. So you're going to go to resources and teachers and ideas and beliefs and answers that you like that go with what you already think. And that's, that's true it's just human nature, really. Um, it's true in the church. It's tr- true in the world. It's true with atheists. It's true with people of other religions. Um, they'll always be able to um, find people who agree with them, and then they'll feel better because, look, everybody else agrees. But that, that of course, again, that's not reasons. Those aren't, those aren't evidence. You actually have to have a basis and a grounding for what you believe. So... Um, you have to start pointing that out. You have to start asking for reasons why. And most of the time, again, they won't actually have reasons, or they'll throw something out there that doesn't actually work because they haven't thought through it. Um, We'll look at a specific example of this. So um, the Bible was corrupted. You'll hear this a lot, right? The Bible was corrupted. We don't have the originals. Um, How do do you respond to that? What What can you tell them, you think? Right. You, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, James White, yep. Um, you, so how do you know that? Yeah, exactly. And they're, they're not going to be like, well, some monk changed it, I'm sure. It's like, did you see the monk change it? Like, how do you know that? Um, and they won't have a reason. And then you can go in and you can show them that, you know, actually the, the Bible wasn't corrupted. It's the most authentic ancient document we have. Um, right? So there's over 6,000 manuscripts. Hundreds of those manuscripts are very early, you know, 100 years after the writing. Um, and this is, this is incredible for any sort of ancient document. So if you compare the Bible to other works, um, there's typically just less than 10 manuscripts, often you know, hundreds or thousands, a uh, thousand years after the original writing. Um, I have an example here, Aristotle Poetics. So everybody, everybody accepts Aristotle wrote the Poetics, and they think it accurately represents what he wrote. But our manuscripts, so the manuscript is right, so there's the original, which is what like Paul wrote, and then there's the manuscript which people copied what Paul wrote over and over again, and then the, the copies we have are usually a manuscript that's way later. So we often don't actually have, we don't have the originals um, for any ancient document really, but we have copies of the original. And we have, we have way more copies of the original than any other ancient work in history. And because of that, we can look at all these different copies and understand exactly what the original said. So because of how much evidence we have of the Bible and of these manuscripts and of the copies, we know, we know exactly what the original wording of the Bible is. And there's, it's really a kind of a science to it. Um, I think we went over this, or Forrest went over this in a series not too long ago. 
and it's it's really an interesting. I find it super interesting the the way that works and how you how you know what was originally said. And we can be we are very very certain of it, more certain than any other work. But what's interesting is people will reject um, other ancient works, or I'm sorry, people will reject the Bible even though they'll accept other ancient works, and they don't have a good reason for it. So it's like, why do you accept other ancient works but not the Bible, right? Like, they're, they're being inconsistent. They say, well, you know, it could have been changed. You don't know. It's like, well, you don't, you don't apply that standard and that, that proof for every other view, so why do you do it here? Um, so it just, again, pointing out their assumptions that they're using to, um, to reject the Bible despite the evidence. So we have, to, we have to be able to challenge these, these assumptions, challenge these worldviews, um, ideas that they don't have a basis for. So third thing is we need to be able to show how they're being inconsistent, how they're not, they're not, um, they're not thinking through things well. And again, I think asking questions is a great way to do that. So, and the more questions you ask, the more inconsistencies you'll see, and you'll start to... to be able to point out and ask questions where what they're saying doesn't work. So there's two types of inconsistencies that you're looking for. So the first type is where the unbeliever's worldview contradicts itself. So their philosophy, their idea, their assumptions um, violate the law of, of non-contradiction. So here's an example. You can't know anything for sure. How would you respond to someone who says that? Sure? Right, exactly, yeah. So they're, they're sure about the statement that you can't know anything for sure, and that's, that doesn't work. That's a contradiction. Um, another example is, the, uh, uh, another type of inconsistency is when the unbeliever does not live consistent with his worldview. So here's an example. Morality is relative. So what kind of questions can you ask to show that they don't actually live according to that statement that they're saying? Morality is relative. Right, whose standard of morality? Um, so it's re yeah, relative to who, it's relative to them. What, what's maybe an example you can give them to show them that they don't actually think morality is relative? Right, yeah, get a, or kill your neighbor or steal your wallet, right? I mean, in the end, there's going to be things, what was that? Right, yeah. Right, and they'll, they'll eventually admit that, right? Um, because morality isn't relative and no one lives like it's relative. Or if they do live like it's relative, um, we typically, they're, they're typically considered extremely evil people. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's, not a, it's not a statement that they, that they can make sense of. Um, so let's, let's look at, so we should have time to show um, an, another example of finding inconsistency. And this is in a, a view that people have about the world that's very common, naturalism. Another, another word you might say is materialism. It's just this idea that all there is, is is the physical matter. It's just nature. There isn't room for anything supernatural. There isn't room for anything like miracles. Um, all we have is, is, is just the physical stuff. Um, and because all we have is the physical stuff, then the way we, we know anything is by using the scientific method, right? The scientific method looks at observations in the world, and that's how we come to conclusions. That's how we know things. Uh, it's a very common world. This is, this is the, the, the philosophy that evolutionists have. They think everything is matter, and so they use this worldview when they're doing science. Um, and this might, you might hear this if someone says something like, science is the only reliable way to know anything. We can only know things for sure if we can prove it with science. And of course, you know, you, every, you should know that by now, the question is, how do you know that, right? What, what evidence do you have? What, what's your reason for that? Um, and really, what they'll often come back with is something like, well, because science has always given us reliable knowledge. So right now, what, what's the problem? This person just committed a logical fallacy. What logical fallacy? Okay, so you, you might be able to prove that science doesn't always work, right? What was that? What do, what do you mean? If science has always given us reliable knowledge, then it is the only way to know anything. 
Right. So it's kind of it's begging the question, right? Yeah. So it, it's sort of it's sort of they're assuming their view to prove their view, and they're not really giving you a good reason for it. Um, so they right. They're saying science is the only reliable way of knowing anything. Well, how do you know that? Well, because it gives us reliable knowledge. Like, well, that's kind of what you're trying to show and prove. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't actually get you anywhere. You might be able to point that out. So it sounds like begging the question: Have you actually tested that statement with science? So as someone, if someone says, you know, uh, yeah, you have to use science to know anything, well, have you used science to prove that statement? And can you? Like, not really, right? You can't test a statement like that. Science can prove the evolutionary theory. No, right. Um, yeah, it depends what you mean by science. But yeah, if you, real science with the right assumptions can't. Um, you have to have, come in with, with the assumption that, um, everything's material and, and that guides how you come to facts. So <clears throat> you can't actually test a statement like that with science, right? Um, you can't actually prove that by looking at the physical world and doing a test. Um, so if it's true, you might ask, how can you be sure you can't actually test? I'm sorry, but if it's true. So yeah, just bringing out the point that you can't test that claim with science, right? Science is the only reliable way to know anything. You, like that's great, but are you? If you're, how can you be sure of that if you haven't actually used your view to test it? Right? If you think you have to use science to prove anything, well, you can't prove that statement with science. So, like, what's the point? How can you be sure of that? So you're just pointing out that they're being inconsistent. So there's two two inconsistencies, um, or a couple that we'll look at with naturalism. The first one is it begs the question, right? So the scientific method only examines the physical world. So it's only going to come up with discoveries that are physical or knowledge that are physical. It's not actually going to get you to anything that's supernatural because it doesn't work that way. It doesn't test things that are supernatural. So it begs the question in the first place. And then also it, it refutes itself. So the, the truth that all truth is discovered by science, you can't actually discover that truth from science, right? It, it's it's self-refuting, just like, just like the claim you know, all truth is relative is, is self-refuting. Well, if all truth is relative, is that truth relative or is it absolute? So all worldviews, including naturalism, are going to be inconsistent. Um, and also, that shows how their worldview is inconsistent. It contradicts itself. But also, no one actually lives that way. No one actually lives like all there is um, is material things in the physical world. And you can point that out by different things. So, like, you know, how do you find meaning in life if we're all just matter crashing into one another, what's, what's the point? How do you get to meaning? They don't actually have a good reason for that. And also, especially um, um, morality, right? I think James was saying that earlier about if, if we're just atoms and matter colliding, then what obligates anyone to do something specifically to um, other atoms and matter, right? It's just, it's just all chemicals um, getting mixed up and, and uh, hitting each other, like there's, there's no right and wrong in that worldview, right? They can't actually explain morality. They, they have morals, right? They, they think they're moral people. They think that those morals apply to everyone in some way, but they can't actually explain that from their worldview. And this, this is true for all non-Christian worldviews. They're always going to be inconsistent and not make sense of the world. They're always going to contradict themselves. Um, and that's because only the, the Bible can explain things. Only the Bible can actually give reasons for things people believe, right? So everybody has some sense of morality, but only the Bible can actually give that grounding and give the reason for that, right? It's because, it's because of um, God that we have morality. It's because he's written his law in everyone's heart. So they, they can't actually account for things. They can't even account for things like science, right? So if in a naturalistic worldview, if everything's chance, why doesn't science change? Why don't physical laws change? Like, do you have any reason to think they shouldn't someday? And they, they don't. They, they can't actually have a reason. But we, we do because we um, believe God. This is God's world. He set it up a certain way. He's a God of order. And he, he makes these things consistent. And the same thing with laws of logic. They'll, they'll, they can't explain those in their world, right? Why does logic have to be the same here as it is somewhere else. Um, everybody knows it's true, um, but they can't actually give good reasons for that. Only the biblical worldview can, can actually make sense of the world. Um, 
and someone, someone shared this quote with me um, from someone who's a naturalist, someone who, who thinks that all there is is the material world. And it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's a really fascinating quote that just shows how with science and with everything else, people have their assumptions, and that's, it's the way they look at the world, and then they fit the facts around it. So this is from someone, this is an evolutionist, so it's not a Christian, um, and they're, they're you know, um, a legitimate professor at Harvard, and this is what they, they say about science. So we'll read the quote. So we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. So it's, imp it's important to realize here, when, when he says science, he's using a, a pretty broad term, and he's, he's kind of meaning evolution, right, in some way. So he's not, we're not, he's not saying the scientific method is bad. We don't say the scientific method is bad. We actually believe in science, and we have a good reason to believe in science. Um, but this, this is what this professor who, who's an evolutionist says. He says, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. So he's admitting that some things that we believe about science are absurd, and they're clearly absurd. We've set up these, these paradigms and these ways of viewing science that just are absurd. But in spite of its failures, in, spi in spite of our view's failures to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, what is an, uh, the idea, what is an unsubstantiated just-so story? Right. So it's, it's like a rescuing device. So they, they, evolutionists, what they do when they can't explain something, they just come up with some story, some narrative, some theory that works around the facts. And they can't actually prove it, but they just, they just, they just make it up, right? They make up stories for things. Um, and they're unsubstantiated. They don't actually have reasons for it. But the reason we do that is because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. So do you hear that term prior commitment? That was, that was in our definition for presuppositionalism, right? Or a presupposition. So people have a presupposition. We have a prior commitment that we're making. And that commitment is to materialism, our worldview that the physical is, is all there is. So they're starting with there can be no God. There can't be something supernatural. And that's a prior commitment they have when they go do science. So because that's a prior commitment that they have, they're never actually going to allow for anything that um, shows there's a God, right? They'll come up with unsubstantiated stories and theories to work around that. So the quote continues, it is not that methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of, of the phenomenal world or the physical world. So he's saying that there's nothing in science that actually tells us we should have this view. We haven't actually proven it from science. But on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori, which is just um, basically their beliefs that they have kind of presuppositions before they come to, to science, by our priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations. So basically what he's saying is we, we've rigged the game, right? We've started and we've set up ways of doing science that will always come to the conclusion we want to come to, that there is no God. Um, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. So no matter how much it doesn't make sense, they're starting with materialism. And then the, the last sentence here gives the reason why all this is the case. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. So that's what it's all about, right? They're starting with their view. They're setting everything up so that their view is always right in their mind in science. Um, and they're doing that because they can't allow for a God. They can't allow a divine foot in the door. Um, and of course, you know, as Christians, we, you know, I, I trust science. I just don't trust people's worldviews, right? I don't trust politics. I don't trust people to be neutral. Um, and people aren't. And when they come to science and anything else, they have these assumptions that they bring to the table, and then they, they w find evidence to support their assumption, and they interpret the evidence to support their assumption. And that's always going to be the case. There's, there's no way around it. So you have to be able to show people that this is what's going on. This is your assumption. You haven't actually proven it. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, and it doesn't actually work. You can't actually make sense of human reality, human experience from it. 
So again, those, quickly to wrap up, those were our four, our four steps. So <clears throat> we're going to ask questions, try to understand where the believers, unbelievers are coming from, and then point out where they don't actually have reasons. They haven't actually thought these things through. And then show how they're living inconsistently with their view. Their view doesn't make sense. It contradicts itself. But the, the biblical worldview is the only one that really makes sense, that really works in the world. So those, those are the four things that you're trying to do when you engage with an unbeliever, to try to show them their presuppositions, their assumptions, and that they, you know, the world is God's world, right? This is the only way to make sense of it is if you look at the Bible and it explains the world in a way that, that works. So let's, uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for um, your word, your word that you've spoken to us creatures. Um, we, we know that we, we need you to tell us truth. We need you to speak authoritatively into our lives, into the world. Um, and it's only when we, we submit ourselves to you that we have truth, that we can understand the world, that we can understand um, everything pertaining to life and godliness. I just pray that you'd give us a submission to your word and that you would help us when we engage with others to show that you are a good God, a, a sovereign God, and a God that created the world that makes it a certain way. And it's, it's because of you that um, anyone is here, anyone can have life and breath. I just pray that you give us a, a humility when we deal with others and a, and a genuine desire to love them and to help them and to uh, show them truth. In Christ's name, amen.